RPGs have a rich history in tying their mechanics to card games. In a lot of ways, it makes sense for a genre that locks its events behind arbitrary limitations to tie resources behind a more commonly accepted form of metagaming, where resource management comes down to deck building and concepts of an item or a move being single use but rechargeable after a certain period doesn't feel like it needs explaining. It's a card game. Card games work like that. At the same time, it invokes feelings of tabletop gaming, where your imagination can forgive all sorts of gaps in reasoning to fill in the blanks with whatever you want them to be. A same kind of mindset that inspired the loose way demons and Dark Souls set their lore loose on players, filled with blanks allowing the players to feel like they're exploring or uncovering things long forgotten as they think about and cover up the patches left intentionally blank between the lines. Why any of this matters? Because we're covering the Dark Souls of Yu-Gi-Oh! in Lost Kingdoms. Lost Kingdoms takes place in Arkwill, a medieval land slowly being taken over by evil black fog that's killing the people, allowing nothing to escape from it or survive. With the fog, demons start invading the lands until one day Kadia's father decides to set out to stop them. Not long after, Kadia herself goes out with the Runestone, a magical device that lets her use cards holding the souls of demons to fight back against them, as well as gaining new souls from the demons she fights and upgrading them. If that doesn't sound familiar enough just yet, even the entire heads-up display is almost identical to the one found in Demon's Soul specifically. And thinking about it more directly, it would make sense that the game's HUD shapes were originally made for a card-focused game, though unlike Demon's or Dark Souls, the story in Lost Kingdoms is a fairly straightforward affair, with cutscenes and characters telling you the story as it unfolds. You often find yourself walking through areas that were once lively and have long since been abandoned, but don't go expecting any deep lore here. Miyazaki didn't work on Lost Kingdoms, though it is interesting to see how close From Software had already gotten to what would become Dark Souls in so many ways, long before they started making the series. People usually focus on Kingsfield when exploring the history of From Software before Dark Souls and how that would end up shaping that series, but Lost Kingdoms is kind of an aspect that's been, well, Lost. Combat in Lost Kingdoms comes down to being an action RPG with semi-random encounters. I say you're semi-random because while they are technically random, the encounter rate appears to be fixed and there's a lot of areas in which enemies don't spawn because the terrain wouldn't make for a decent fight arena. Once you're sucked into a fight, the areas surrounding you are blocked off with magical barriers, kind of like in Okami. You're still allowed to run away from combat at the cost of a single random card, which in some situations might be the right choice depending on what you're going for. Cards come in three types. There's attack cards, which when used attack another enemy directly, like a sword slash or a whip attack or a projectile. These cards often have a lot of uses before they used up. Once a card is used up, it's gone for the rest of the stage, and the same goes for the cards you use running away. Because of this, you want a good mixture of cards you can use to defeat multiple demons with before they're gone, and cards that hit hard. Attack cards are usually decent for that first reason, though they have another benefit to them. During your card animation, you have iframes. It's something that feels like it's an exploit, but the game even tells you to abuse this. And attack cards are a good way to get around being hit without costing too much. This feels like a concession towards how stiff the combat can be. You don't have the movement options to get out of the way of most attacks, and the game's structure feels so rigid it would likely break completely with a higher freedom of movement. There are fights against other summoners in the game, and they have a dodge roll in their kit, and it makes me wonder if this was ever intended for the player or not, though speculating on this won't get us anywhere. As it is, the way iframes work feel like they're an intentional part of the game design, rather than an oversight, and it is something that the combat flow actually required. The second type are minion cards. You throw them on the ground and you summon a minion that does something. Some will fight for you, others give you a special buff so long as they're on the screen. 
Once you start getting some better cards and figure out how to deal with the enemy AI, these become the best way to deal with smaller enemies during stages, since they mostly degrade in durability by being hit by other enemies. Drawing attention away by aggroing enemies yourself so they can blindside them is a pretty cost-effective way to take down as many demons as you can without having to spend a single full card. Holding down the button when you're throwing a cart lets you control where they land, and as long as you're controlling the cart's direction, you can't be hurt either, letting you cheese through some damage cleanly if you time it just right. Then there's summons. They're single use and often do a big attack or restore up used cards and health. Their quality really varies, as some barely have range, while others have too long a startup animation to hit the faster enemies. Sometimes the big summons are the harder cards to justify having in your deck because they're single use and they tend to cost more magic stones to use than other cards. Magic stones are your main resource for using cards. Every card is a stone count next to their type, and using them uses up magic stones from your pool. Every time you hit an enemy, they drop colored stones. Picking them up replenishes your magic stones. It's an extra way to get you to be more conservative with your cards and not brute force your way through combat, and I think they tie into the experience points you get at the end of combat, though I can't say for sure how they're distributed. Your main source of experience for cards tends to be by having a card give the finishing blow to an enemy. Every enemy demon has an amount of experience they give, and the last hit decides what card the experience goes to. There's no leveling system in Lost Kingdoms. Instead, the experience lets you power up your deck between stages, a structure that probably also sounds very familiar to Dark Souls players. One of my biggest issues with the game is the camera, although that's mostly a generational issue. You can use the C-Stick to move the camera in set angles, instead of giving you a complete free look style of camera. This would have been fine if the stages didn't feel like they were designed diagonally half the time, making none of the stiff camera angles feel like they're properly covering the stage layout comfortably. Again, this feels like something that's a sign of the times that came out during, but it doesn't make it feel any better. In between every stage, you can pick the next area on the stage select screen. Though, there generally isn't much of a point to this screen in most cases, because you're not allowed to backtrack. Once you've finished an area, that's it. You can't go back to it anymore. In most cases, that means you have three options. You go to the next stage, you go to the shop, or you go to the Red Fairy House. The Red Fairy House is where you drop off the Red Fairies that you find in stages for rewards. It's a lot like the Red Jewel system in Illusion of Gaia. Every stage has a bunch of them hidden, and upon returning them there, you get a reward once you reach a certain threshold. I'd advise people to look up a guide for them. There are spoiler-free guides that tell you how many there are in each area, and where they are without saying anything else about the stage. So if you still want to be able to explore without possibly missing anything, that's the way to go. I'm generally not fond of this kind of design. Collectibles? I'm okay with. Missable side content is fine too, as long as it's signaled well to the player. But missable collectibles are one of the things that I don't think I can ever really accept because it just sets you on a game-long journey with the knowledge that you're working towards something that you can no longer complete. Normally I'm against guides, but when these sorts of things pop up, I still use them because of the trauma the Fisherman's Red Jewel and the Illusion of Gaia has left me with. The shop is where you can buy, sell, copy, or transform cards. You don't find gold in the stages, so the only gold you'll get is from selling off cards you no longer need. The selection in the store is usually not too great, so this isn't a big deal. Sometimes there's a useful card in there, but as far as I'm aware, there aren't any store-exclusive cards you can't get otherwise. The biggest draw of the store is the ability to transform or copy monsters using experience points. Copying is pretty straightforward. If you have enough experience points for a card, you can copy it, so now you have two copies of that card. Transform lets you change one card into another. Usually there's three possible choices of cards they can turn into, increasing in rarity and experience cost. You can get most of the boss cards and rare cards in the game this way if you experiment around enough. It's a pretty versatile system that lets you improve your deck without really relying on outside cards coming in too heavily. Which is good because the way you could normally get the boss cards is complete RNG. Upon clearing a stage, you get to pick a number of cards from a pile. The number you can draw depends on your stage clear rank, and you can't see the cards you got until you made your choice, making it entirely possible to get a high rank and still not walk out with anything but trash.
Because of this, the store is the best way to get cards, and with this being my third playthrough of the game, I've come to the conclusion that the best way to play through the game is doing every stage twice. The first time, you explore the stage, you get the red fairies, you figure out where everything is, and you only open the chests that are not in the critical path. Then when you get to the boss, you abort the mission. You still get to keep everything you picked up along the way, so don't worry about this. Lost Kingdoms treats aborting a stage the same way that it does death, so even if you die you get to keep everything you found along the way, including experience and red fairies. This also includes chests, which will remain open the next time you visit the area. And that's actually a bad thing. Every stage has a checkpoint that lets you recover your health and add cards that you found while you were in the stage to your deck to make up for the used up cards. If you're afraid of running out of cards, which you likely will early on if you don't have too many cards that will recover up the used ones, it's the best way to leave chests for a more optimal run, where you know where things generally are and you can make a clean run for the chests and boss to clear the stage. This idea of exploring stages is doubled by the fact that a lot of the time there's breakable objects that hide stuff underneath or behind them. The way to break these things is by attacking them. But you can only use your cards while in combat, so you have to drag out an enemy encounter in the spot where these objects are. If you want to conserve resources for the boss fights at the end of the stage, it's usually for the best to aim for these things in a run where you have no intention to clear the stage. Since you're going to do two runs of every stage, you have plenty of experience to upgrade your deck to your liking and you won't fall behind the power curve too much, something I originally struggled with on my first playthrough. Though back then I also didn't know about the bonus stages. Playing like this, Lost Kingdoms only took about 5-6 hours to beat, so don't worry about the game dragging out by doubling stages. They're all about 10-5 to five minutes each, so it never ends up feeling tedious. When talking to the old woman at the shop, she can sometimes tell you about other areas that have something going on, which then unlocks a side stage outside of the normal progression. Doing this should give you a lot of experience and cards that you otherwise never would have had. In a game where you can't repeat stages upon clearing them, this is incredibly useful to have access to. Though you might want to wait until the first big upgrade before you go through them though. Although there is no leveling system, there are set moments in the game where your crystal and health pool get upgraded due to story beats that make you stronger. It's very interesting to have the change in power of the main character tied to the story while the deck you use comes from the combat experience itself. There's still moments near the end of the game where it feels like there should be another health or crystal upgrade with how much the costs and damage start to go through the roof. But I have a number of frustrations with the last two boss fights in the game in general that wouldn't really be fixed by that either. Though I don't want to spoil anything, it basically comes down to an abundance of iframes in their animations. It makes it hard to decide when you can actually attack them instead of wasting your cards, crystals, or getting stuck in a position where you can do nothing but take the hit. It's not fun. Though at least it's not something that is a problem in the rest of the game. Overall, I quite like Lost Kingdoms. It's not a great game or a well-polished one, though the latter is almost a given considering it's from software that made it, and it's really clear it was them every step of the way, right down to some of the sound effects in menus. There's a lot of quirks that can either be a deal breaker or don't bother you that much, but I generally quite like the special things it does with its combat. If it looks interesting to you, give it a shot. It emulates just fine on Dolphin, though I did have some issues with the opening and ending cutscenes not showing for me. At least these are issues that don't tie into the gameplay problems. Anyway, this was above up and uh... Yeah, it was fun playing an old favorite like this again. This was actually one of the first games that I streamed back when I really actively was on Twitch. And it's nice bringing back the old context of the kind of games that From Software used to make. I do miss them experimenting in their titles like this. It's something they don't really do anymore, and it's the part that actually made me appreciate them and look forward to their titles, and that's kind of disappeared after five Souls games. The next video will be something that most people probably won't see coming, unless they've read the Patreon updates, and also a slime missile mech game. Please look forward to it. As always, this video has been brought to you by the people you see scrolling on the screen right now. If you'd like to become one of the scrolling people on the screen, head over to patreon.com slash above up and I will uh, see ya.